Hello everyone, uh, Dr. Thomas here. A little video for you to explain uh, fiscal policy. And uh, truly, we explain the whole uh, half of economics called macroeconomics because of one fellow that came along in the uh, early part of the 20th century. His name was uh, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes. And he realized that he could actually uh, develop uh, the process of helping the economy get out of recessions, out of depressions. In fact, you could help the economy avoid to get in them in the first place. So uh, he developed a very uh, interesting model of the economy, which we use to do this kind of uh, avoidance. This is it. How do you know that? Because I say so. Okay, It's a lot quicker if you just trust me, especially under the current conditions where I, I don't uh, get to meet with you face to face and help you through this. So uh, let's take this for granted. I'm going to call it the double star equation. So we have a name for it. All the things in here are defined in this legend. So um, Y is a gross domestic product, basically your output for the country. Little b, lowercase b, is what Keynes called the marginal propensity to consume. Now, um, that means that if you gave uh, the average person in the country you're, you're speaking of a dollar, of, uh, of money to spend, how much of it would they spend, and how much of it would they save. So this B is going to be a number between zero and one, one being where you spend the whole dollar, uh, zero would be you spent none of it, uh, 0.5 would be, well, you spend half of it. Now, if you don't spend it, what happens to the part you don't spend? Well, it becomes saved. So that's savings. So your spending plus your saving would equal the whole dollar. So we're looking at the part that you're spending, probably around, you know, for our country, probably on the average uh, 0.95 or so. Then um, how many taxes do you have in your life? Dozens? Well, um, we require some pretty advanced mathematics to address all of those. So we're just going to uh, look at a couple of them so that you can do them with the math that's required for your course. We'll look at a flat tax or a proportional tax, the same tax with two different names. Uh, it means that everybody pays the same percentage of their income. Um, this was debated in the uh, Reagan administration for a while, it didn't get through Congress, uh, but they came up with about 20% being the amount that if you taxed everybody, rich, poor, uh, and everyone in between, 20% that you'd get about the same amount of revenue that you were getting with the current uh, income tax system, which was a progressive system. So uh, that would be the same percentage for everybody. And then we're gonna have another one called a lump sum tax. This one you'll be actually able to play with. Uh, it's simple enough in the uh, mathematical uh, requirements that you'll be able to increase and decrease it and see what happens to your economy. A lump sum tax just means uh, uh, pick a number and collect that from the economy. Uh, used to be uh, in uh, uh, Europe, say, if you went back to the feudal period, uh, the baron might be collecting taxes and might uh, not be collecting money, but things like a chicken. So maybe a chicken for every peasant. And uh, it was called a head tax. Uh, pretty accurate because if you didn't pay your chicken, you lost your head. <clears throat> and you wanted one chicken for every head that you saw. So the tax collectors, the baron's tax collectors would go out and collect the chickens if there were a thousand peasants and the baron wanted to see a thousand chickens. 
So that'd be a lump sum of a thousand. And the Baron probably didn't really care uh, if someone paid two chickens and someone else you didn't, couldn't catch them. And so they paid zero chickens as long as it totaled to a thousand. So that's why the lump sum tax um, existed. We don't have that anymore. Um, the most recent one would be like a hundred years ago, the zakat that the uh, Sheikh of the Hejaz the, along the Red Sea would charge for the pilgrims performing the Hajj and uh, in exchange would guarantee their safety and, and give them food and water and um, the clothing, special clothing that they needed for their uh, pilgrimage. So we don't really have that today, but it, we need something like that so that it's simple enough mathematically so you can play with it. Um, with the wealth effect on consumption. If you had a, a bag of diamonds from your Uncle Fester when he passed on, that would affect your spending, your consumption. Uh, wealth is um, saved up income from the past. If you look at a bathtub, the water coming out of the spigot would be your income. Your spending would be the water going down the drain. And then the uh, level of water in the bathtub would be your wealth. So that would be past income that you hadn't spent yet. Businesses spend. Call that business spending. Uh, governments spend. Call that government spending. Uh, then in a foreign market, you sell to foreigners, that's your exports, and you buy from foreigners, that's your imports. So these are the letters that are essentially the variables that will represent these concepts, and we stick them in here because Keynes told us to. Okay, And then you, if you know all these things on the right-hand side, you can solve for what your GDP will be. So what the, the idea is that you're going to use this to get an idea of, of what your GDP is now or what it could be in the future. Um, typically, what we're doing is trying to create jobs for our fellow Americans. If the unemployment rate is at a healthy rate, we don't need to do anything. Just leave it alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if there aren't enough jobs and people are unemployed, people that really shouldn't be unemployed, but they're unemployed anyway. You want to give them jobs, create jobs for them. How do you create jobs? By spending. So you need to figure out how many more dollars of spending you need to create the number of jobs that you need. Now, the problem with this for Keynes is if you asked him, great, uh, John Maynard, um, <clears throat> How many dollars should we spend, say, to lower the unemployment rate by 1%? He would have said, uh, I don't know. Why don't you spend some and see if it's enough? And if it's not, spend some more. And if it's too much, then stop spending. Okay, well, I mean, that's better than nothing. However, we have this other fellow who came along. Lucky for us. His name was Arthur Oaken, and he found out that if you increase GDP by a certain percentage, namely exactly 2%, you'll decrease the unemployment by 1%. So that tells you exactly how many dollars you'd need to spend, how much you need to increase GDP to get rid of the amount of unemployment you might have. So I'm going to come back to this, but uh, before we leave it, let's look at how you would express what Oaken found out algebraically. So it's called Oaken's Law, very important when things are called laws. It says that a 2% increase in GDP, which is our Y variable, causes a 1% decrease in actual unemployment. I have that defined up there. 
You can go the other way. If you've got too many people employed and you want to uh, cool off, dampen your economy a little bit, you can go the other way and um, increase by 1% by decreasing 2% on the GDP. So we'll come back and look at this. But before we do that, let's finish our Keynesian model. So we're going to use the double star equation, the uh, Keynesian model, to um, determine the proper fiscal policy actions that our economy should take. So that means changes in government spending, G, or changes in taxes, uh, our big T or our little t. Um, let's try. Oh, here's something interesting that he found. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I hope that's not a harbinger of things to come. When you spend money, you spend it typically at a store. The store takes the money and then uh, pays for all its costs. So let's buy a, a, a little tub of gum at Target. And let's say it costs $5. So what does Target do with the $5? It uh, takes the $5, pays the employees that helped you. An employee showed you where the gum was. An employee checked you out. An employee took a putty knife and scraped the gum from underneath the shelf when you sampled a little bit before you left the store and then stuck it under there. They pay for whoever supplied the gum. Maybe it was Trident or Wrigley's or whoever, okay? They pay for their utilities, so PNN, gas company in Mexico, et cetera, right? All this, and then maybe some rent to the landlord. Also, maybe a little bit of uh, profit to the owners of Target. So the $5 is split up that way, and now the $5 is gone. But what happens to it is that it becomes income either to the employees, which you can see that right away being income that the employees would consider spending on the things that they needed. But um, the landlord, uh, PNM, Wrigley's, Trident, they also take that money that you gave them for the tub of gum, this the little part of the $5, whatever they got, and they treat that as their income and use it to cover their costs or if they're a person earning a wage or salary, right away it becomes their income and they spend it. Can you see then that the initial $5 of spending would get spent again and again and again? Now, let's look at the size of it. Some people, and that's why you're here studying, is you want to be reaching a point in your life where you can actually save some money. Some people save. So out of that $5 when it's spent and becomes income, not all of it would get spent again. Some of it would be saved. Also, some of it is taxed. So the second round of spending that would occur would be less than $5 because of savings and taxes. Then there'd be a third round, a fourth round, a fifth round of spending at each point getting smaller, smaller, smaller because of saving and taxes. So we can find the total effect that would occur over, oh, it takes months for this to happen by using something called the multiplier. Now, the multiplier is out here in the double star equation In the front of it, for government spending, actually it could be any of these things, but the, the thing we have control over mostly is uh, government spending. So G times this thing out here will tell you, you know, if you increase G by one, then Y would, would change by one times this thing out here. That's the multiplier for G. For taxes, we're going to use capital T, the lump sum tax. If you increased or decreased or changed taxes by one, that change would get multiplied by minus B and then times this. So let's look at what the multipliers would be for government spending. 
It's this. So basically, to summarize, the G multiplier tells you how much income will eventually be created when you change G by a dollar. We're talking about all those rounds of spending until it reaches zero. Okay. It takes months, almost a year, probably, for fiscal policy. Okay. So you have to keep track. If you're going to do this right, you're going to be an economist on the Council of Economic Advisors to the President, like Arthur Oaken was for John F. Kennedy, you're going to need to keep track of what you did a few months ago because it's still having an impact today. The T multiplier is basically the G multiplier times minus B, or you could just put the minus B in the numerator. So any change in, in your lump sum tax gets multiplied by that. So the T multiplier tells you how much income will eventually be created when we change taxes by a dollar. Okay. So I have written this kind of uh, as I would uh, speak to a layman about it, someone who hasn't got any economic training. So let's uh, go out and measure all those things on the right-hand side of the double star equation and find their values, bring them back. We're also going to measure unemployment and compare it to the optimal rate of unemployment, which is called the natural rate of unemployment. This is the, the healthy rate uh, that your economy uh, could maintain year after year, um, not too low, not too high. It's kind of the baby bear's porridge level of unemployment. So, if you're a policy person for the government, you could ask yourself, well, let's see, if actual unemployment is 5.6 and the natural rate or healthy rate would be 5, are you happy? And you could say, well, not really, because you've got 6 tenths of a percent of unemployment that you'd like to get rid of. So you'd like actual employment to be 6 tenths of a percent lower. Algebraically, you could find that change that you want, the desired percentage change or change in the percent of the actual unemployment, uh, the natural rate minus the actual rate. So 5 minus 5.6, you'd like it to drop 6 tenths of a percent. How do we go about doing this? Well, we use Keynes' work, the double star equation along with its multipliers. And we use Oaken's law that Arthur Oaken discovered. And we eliminate the unwanted amount of actual unemployment. Now, if we take for our third step there, uh, Oaken's law, if you remember, this is Oaken's law. The algebraic formula would be this one. So the desired percent change in GDP would be minus 2 times the desired percent change in your unemployment. So that would be the minus 0.6%. So you'd want a 1.2% increase in your GDP to get unemployment to drop 6 tenths of a percent. Okay, 1.2% increase in GDP. How many dollars is that? So now we need to figure out how many dollars of tax cut or uh, increase in government spending will make this happen. So the first thing we do is we're going to solve for what GDP is now. We use the double star equation for that. Then you figure out what 1.2% of that is in dollars. And then third, you uh, figure out how many dollars to increase government spending or how many dollars to decrease taxes uh, to make Y go up by the appropriate amount. So you use the multipliers for that. 